Well, hey everybody, Larry Sparks here, and I typically don't just do videos like this, particularly across multiple platforms on YouTube through our Destiny Image page, and then of course my two Larry Sparks pages, but I figured, well, I had a dream, and I don't get that many dreams and visions. However, I'm going to start prophesying and declaring over my life, thank you, Lord, that I get lots of dreams and visions, because I realized it's probably not very helpful for me to go around saying, oh, I don't get very many. So I'm going to start agreeing. Listen, I'm not just going to give some positive confession. The language of the last days is dreams and visions. The language of the last days outpouring of the Holy Spirit, according to Joel 2, and of course, Acts chapter 2, is in the last days. I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. And part of the outpouring of the Spirit is the language, the prophetic language of dreams and visions. So welcome, everybody. Nice to see you. In just a moment, I'm going to get started because I had a dream and I felt like this is very significant because the words in this dream, I believe, are absolutely and utterly invaluable, I dare say essential to our future as the church, to Christianity, and to revival. So let me know where you're watching from. Again, you might be watching in the archive. You might be watching weeks later. That's totally fine. But for those of you who are watching right now, I want to believe for a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit on your life. I was just chatting with a friend of mine, Jody Hughes, and we were talking about a recent service. So nice to see you all. Hello. I'll, I'll share this and then I'll dive on in. But I think this is worth noting. We were talking about a recent service where her and her husband, Ben Hughes, were ministering at Church of His Presence, John Kilpatrick's church. I just had John Kilpatrick on the show. I love that man. Why? Because after all these years, he's still hungry. After all these years, John Kilpatrick is still desperate for the Holy Spirit. He has not graduated from being a hungry man for God. Well, they were ministering, Jody and Ben, at Church of His Presence, John Kilpatrick's church. And Jody made this note. And this is something that the entirety of the church in Western civilization, America and beyond, should pay careful attention to because she preached and then they were praying for people. And she said, I guess they prayed for people maybe for three hours and beyond that Sunday, again, last month. And she said this, it reminded her of when they were all ministering together, Ben and Jody, Jesse and Parker, Tommy and Miriam. I've been at some of those meetings in fields in Kentucky, like in the mud, in the rain, where it was not pretty, it was not comfortable, it was not air conditioned. Believe me, I was there. I'm sure some of you, how many of you were on the Wells of Revival tour? Were we going? We were going to these outdoor locations, different places in Kentucky, near where the Cane Ridge Revival happened, the Red River Me Meeting House. But I remember one of those gatherings where it was raining, and man, you needed galoshes. You needed like Holy Ghost galoshes to go sloshing around in the field because you didn't just step on the ground. The ground started to suck you down, the mud. And Jody said, you know what? The cry, the raw cry of hunger and desperation for God at Church of His Presence last week, in a nice, air-conditioned, beautiful building, is the same cry, is that similar cry, that raw, unfiltered, desperation cry for God that they experienced, that they saw, that we all tasted and measure in Kentucky. God will meet you in the field, and He'll meet you in the building. And I prophesy right now as I get ready to share this dream, it is the hour and it is the day of the field and the pulpit for tents and also for the traditional church. Because in revival circles, we really like one or the other. I, I'm done with this one or the other nonsense. Can I just say that? I'm going to say it one way or the other. It's not the field or the church. It's not the tent or the building. It's both. Somebody needs to hear that so we can all lock arms in unity. I was just talking, reading uh, in River Glory from Ruth Ward Heflin. She also has a book on uh, unity glory or something like that talking about the need for all the different streams and camps to flow together, for us to operate together. So I bless the work of God in the pulpit and on the field. It's both. It's Cane Ridge and Jonathan Edwards. Cane Ridge was outdoors, tens of thousands in a camp meeting type scenario. And then you had Jonathan Edwards, who represented the more traditional type of church, Father, let it burn. Let the Holy Spirit fire burn in both. And the reality is, whether you're in the mud or you're in a beautiful building, 
God does not look at the location. He looks at the desperation. God is not attracted into an atmosphere. God, God, the spirit of God. Listen, he's sovereign. I get it. But there is a cry that breaks the heavens. There's a cry that is heard in the heavens that somehow draws the manifest presence of God in a powerful way. I don't understand all of that. All I know is that he does respond to hunger and he is not looking whether or not that cry. I feel the Holy Ghost on this right now. Just get ready. Ha. Ah, God is not looking and evaluating the cry based on the environment it comes out of. Somebody get ready to run around the room because this is going to set people free and this is going to bring unity. God does not evaluate the cry based on whether that cry came out of a multi-million dollar air-conditioned building that rivals the best that Disney World has to offer. That doesn't matter to God, nor does a mud hut in you know, outer Mongolia. That doesn't matter to God, nor does the building. What matters to God is the desperate cry that says, Lord, I must have you. Whether it's coming out of the air conditioning building, whether it's coming out of the field where your feet are sinking in the mud, he is looking for that cry that says, God, I'm not going to ask for your presence on my terms. I believe the leaders really set the goal in this. Now, you seek God no matter what leaders are doing. But church leaders and pastors, we need to be the ones who lead by example. And I felt like the Holy Spirit said, lead by desperation. Pastors and leaders lead by hunger. Lead by worship. Be those who are in the front row engaging fully with the Holy Spirit, worshiping God extravagantly. Be those who, like John Kilpatrick, would go to the church in the middle of the night and cry out to God. Say, God, there's got to be more. God responds. To the cry. He responds to the desperate cry, whether it comes out of the building or whether it comes out of the field. Okay. I wanted to share that, but now I want to share this dream because this was very important. Now, some people like my dear friend, Gina Golston or Lana Voster, I really need them to like take their hands, lay them on my head so that I can remember my dreams in full technicolor detail. I'm sure some of you might have that gift and grace. My wife's had a few dreams where she has literally remembered it down to the iota of detail. Have you guys ever had that happen where you've had a dream where you can literally like remember every bit, every, well, I, I, I didn't, but the Lord knows he, he, he knows what he's working with when he gives me a dream. So he gave me this dream and I actually wrote it down because I want to make sure I'm sharing the right thing. He gave me this dream and I want to share with you what took place, at least what I can remember, because it was quite significant. And let's see, as long as, let's see. Well, Holy Spirit, I hope I wrote it down somewhere. Otherwise, that's a real, that's a bummer if I did not write down what the Lord gave me. <laughs> oh, goodness. You can tell that dreams are a new territory for me. I wrote it down. Okay. Let me share it. I said, I had a dream last night where I began to write in stone. And I knew what I was writing in stone in this dream were the essential old school, emphasis on that phrase, old school truths that fueled the church, that ignited the church with Pentecostal power. I've obviously begun, been going after Pentecostal fire. Um, let me know if you've been able to read this book yet, because this has represented 22 years of me pressing in for this. I don't envision myself writing any new books. I'm sure I'll help other people with their books, but this is the message that God has me on. And a lot of this actually in some way, shape or form is in this book, but the truths that I was writing in stone, I believe they represented those essential non-negotiable foundations that fueled the church with Pentecostal power. But sadly, these truths, I believe, have been exchanged and traded for a younger, hip, more relevant model. Selah on that one. These ancient boundary stones. You know what scripture says? Proverbs 22, verse 28. It says, do not remove the ancient landmark or the ancient boundary stones. Do not move or remove the ancient boundary stones which your fathers have set. 
I believe these core doctrines, and I'm going to give you three. I'm going to give you at least the three that I remember. Maybe the Lord had more that he had me writing down in the dream. But he, but the three that I wrote down were very specifically communicated. Like I think I did my best to capture the language that I had in the dream. But I'm convinced if we make these three things priority. And when I say these three things, not at the expense of other things. We need to preach the word of God. We need to teach the scriptures. In the midst of our revival environments and climates, we need to make sure we are prioritizing the word. I don't have time to go into this, but my wife had such a powerful revelation in that, you know, in the 21st century, we are enamored by worship, music. Let me say it that way, because worship is not just music. 21st century church, we are enamored by the music. In fact, a lot of people will go to churches based on what kind of music they have. That's just how it goes. Now, like I always say, I, you know, listen, I'm not going somewhere that's going to bang pots and pans together, okay? However, the point is this. There's a lot of places with music and worship music that can create an atmosphere for people to experience the Lord and people recognize presence on the worship. Okay, I'm going somewhere with this. Well, here's my concern, though. How many people are preaching to where what they are preaching and teaching, that same presence that's on the worship is on the preaching? Because my history books record of people like Finney and Whitfield, people like Jonathan Edwards and the Wesley brothers. I think of people like D.L. Moody, R.A. Torrey, Smith Wigglesworth, John G. Lake. The list goes on and on. People that when they preach, Leonard Ravenhill, there was fire. There is anointing, the same anointing that we are so drawn to in atmospheres of praise and worship, which is wonderful. I believe that anointing, that weight, that presence need to, it must continue and be sustained and carried on our preaching. But in order for that to happen, and I'm going to say it because it needs to be said, life lessons, TED Talk messages ain't going to cut it. I'm convinced, I'll get right back into the dream and then we'll finish up. I'm convinced that one of the reasons we are not seeing a greater demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit, Pentecostal fire, whatever we want to call it, one of the reasons we are not seeing more has nothing to do with the fact that, well, we're just not living in that dispensation or we're just not living in that period of outpouring. Or, you know, It's so easy for us to make excuses for our lack of power when, in fact, I believe the reason, primary reason for our lack of power is we are not preaching a gospel compatible with power. We are not preaching a message. We are not thundering a gospel. We are not teaching the word of God. We are not delivering a word that is ultimately worthy of the attestation of signs, wonders, and miracles because Mark chapter 16 tells us they went around and they preached the word with signs following, okay? Well, Jesus is going to back up the word with signs following. What if we're not preaching the word? What if we're preaching? And Michael Kalianos just beautifully talked about this. You can hear his message at Global Awakening, Signs, Wonders, and Church Growth. But he was basically talking about, hey, you go to a church and they're going to tell you how to have a happy life, how to have a good business, how to fulfill your destiny, how to be the man or woman of your dreams, how to have your best life, all of that kind of thing. But you know what? That is not, oh, that is not how they preached for 1900 years. That is not, not well, let's say like 1970 years, 1980 years. Let's say that. That is not, I mean, up until the 50s and 60s, people were not preaching life lessons, TED Talk. We're going to make you feel good. Why are we preaching those things? Often motivated by good intentions. Well, we want to bring as many people as possible. That, that, I can tell you, John G. Lake and Wigglesworth, we're not thinking about, well, how many? How are we going to bring as many people as possible? Do you know what they did? They preached the gospel, signs and wonders happened, and people would see the miracles, and the miracles would actually draw people in. But they did not water down the message. They did not dumb down the message. They didn't think to themselves, well, we're in a more progressive age, so we need to preach a message ultimately that you know people will like and it'll make them comfortable and that type of thing. No, it's nonsense, okay? I'm just going to say it here. That is utter and absolute nonsense. Preach the gospel again. Praise God for Jesus' image. Praise God, praise God for Michael Koulianos. The reason I'm mentioning him is I watched that video last night, and it deeply marked me. Not only marked me because of that, marked me because even, oh, I'm going to go here, then I'll finish up, in our charismatic world. And listen, I'm proudly charismatic, Pentecostal, prophetic, all that. Have we made an idol out of secondary things. Have we gotten so enamored by portals 
and realms and dimensions? Have we gotten so intrigued by activating people and prophetic words and being able to get somebody's social security number and address? Have we become so enamored by those types of things that we've backed away from the only thing, the one thing that matters, and that is the gospel of Jesus? I'm preaching basically what Michael was preaching. I want to give him credit because he preached that. It pierced my heart. And I said, God, the Pentecostal gospel, it's not a gospel that's all about the Holy Spirit, signs, wonders, miracles, and demonstrations of power. A Pentecostal gospel, a Pentecostal style of preaching preaches the word of God, preaches Jesus, the son of God, Jesus the man, Jesus, the lamb, Jesus, the lion. I don't have time to go into that. I'm going to actually post that video now that I'm thinking about it because it so impacted me. I think it'll impact you. Bottom line is this, is we're not seeing the demonstrations of power that I believe are available. The greater things, the greater works that I believe ultimately God wants to release and manifest through an end time church. We're not seeing it because we're not necessarily preaching a gospel or a word compatible or worthy or fit for the reinforcement of signs, wonders, and miracles. I don't want to say that mean and cranky like. I'm just saying, preach the gospel. I'm saying, preach the word. I'm saying, do not ignore. Come on, Gina, I was just mentioning you. Oh, Gina, I, I don't know if you can like release impartation over the computer, but I, I need some help with dream, remembering dreams because, again, the Lord gave me this dream about the ancient boundary stones. Again, reminding the folks who are just coming in, I was, all I remember is I was writing in the ground, I was writing in stone, and the Lord reminded me of that scripture, Proverbs 22, verse 18, do not remove the ancient landmarks or the ancient boundary stones which your fathers have set, and the Lord had me writing three things. I could have written more, I don't remember the others, but I wrote three things there, like I was writing with my finger, if I remember correctly, in stone, and I do remember Three things that I felt like the Holy Spirit was highlighting to me that are essential for the future of Christianity, the future of the, uh, of the church, non-negotiable foundation, ancient boundary stones. And this is what the Lord gave me. And this is the best I could in terms of remembering the language. Number one, the blood of Jesus. Oh, somebody preach about the precious blood of Jesus again. I'm just going to stay on that for a moment. The blood of Jesus. Oh, that it would not be considered elementary or menial. Oh, that it would not be considered some basic thing. There are folks who don't even sing or preach about the blood of Jesus. I'm talking about in church because they are con they are concerned it's going to offend folks and it's going to drive them away. No, I declare even right now in the name of Jesus, break off that spirit of cowardice. And guess what? That comes on all of us. I'm not thinking of a certain man or a woman right now. I'm not thinking of a person right now specifically who is operating in some sort of cowardice over this. I'm just saying there is a spirit of cowardice, I believe, that's come upon the body of Christ that we withdraw, we back down, we back up, and we are afraid to talk about the precious blood of Jesus. Well, it's a little gory. It's a little offensive. Can't we just say something else? Can't we? Can't, no, we can't say something else because that's the most precious, valuable thing in the whole of creation, the blood of Jesus. Why? Well, number two, so I said, number one, the blood of Jesus. Number two, and this, this was the language I felt like the Holy Spirit gave to me. The gospel of sinful man or sinful mankind being reconciled to a holy God. Oh, my. I'm, a, I'm sorry. I'm hearing like banging on the ceiling. Holy Ghost. But I want to encourage you. It's one of those things that the gospel is not. I just got to tell you what it's not. The gospel is not, well, Jesus died so I could have a good life. Um, I'm, I'm sure many of you who have followed me enough know that I get worked up over this. The gospel is not Jesus died so I could actually have an abundant life. We've redefined what an abundant life is. Well, Jesus died on the cross. I'd be very interested to go around and poll a bunch of folks in the modern church and ask them, what do you believe Jesus died for? Because I have heard some of the most idiotic things, and I'm not speaking about a person. I'm speaking about the presentations of the gospel that have somehow crept in and influenced the modern, contemporary, feel-good, relevant church. Well, you know, Jesus died 
so I wouldn't have to be lonely anymore. Jesus died so I could feel significant. Jesus died so I could have a brand, well, come on, even a brand new life. Define what it means. Jesus died, and I'm going to declare what I saw in the spirit in this dream. He died. The gospel is about sinful man. You and I were born into sin. You and I were born into separation from God. You and I were born into death because of Adam, because of Adam and Eve's sin. We were born into that. God loved us. He didn't hate us. God loved us. But we were alienated. We were distant. We were disconnected from God. Why? Because sin nature, a sin nature lived inside of us. Some people would call it the depravity of man. Bottom line is we were dead in our sin, as Paul makes it very clear, the church in Ephesus. We were dead in sin, but God. But God made us alive in Christ. Again, the gospel is this, sinful man being reconciled to a holy God. If people preach anything other than that, again, it doesn't have to be in that language, but that's the essence, that's the heart of the gospel. I believe we are entertaining that something at best is a real watered down presentation uh, and at worst, a false gospel. I'm just going to say it like it is because we must understand what we're saved from for it to have any weight, for it to have any substance. Do you agree? Like I will, you know, Romans 12, one says, in view of his mercy, view of God's mercy, offer up your life as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. I love that in view, in view of his mercy, NIV says, uh, presents it that way. In view of God's mercy, offer up your life as a living sacrifice. What does that mean? When I consider, when I behold his mercy, what does that mean? He mercifully saved me. I deserved hell death, and a lifetime of separation from God because of my sin. But in his mercy, he sent Jesus. In his mercy, the blood of Jesus cleansed me of all sin and unrighteousness. In his mercy, not only is my name written down in the Lamb's book of life and I'll be in heaven forever, in his mercy here in the earth, I can live as a temple and a house of the Holy Ghost. Wow. Talk about walking in the fire of Pentecost. It is mercy. That's his mercy. If I define the mercy of God as, well, Jesus gave me a brand new start. Jesus is my buddy. Jesus is my homeboy. Jesus gives me life abundantly. Jesus will give me my best life now. If I define the mercy of God as anything outside of Jesus making it possible for a sinful dead person to be reconciled to and reconnected with an absolutely holy God. If I define or redefine the mercy of God as anything outside of that and thus try to redefine the gospel, coming up with this goofball nonsense that's perpetrating, that perpetrating, well, perpetuating, but it's perpetrating something. This goofball nonsense. I'm sick of it. I'm sick of it. And listen, there's a lot of genuinely saved, born-again people who have either believed it, bought into it, preach it, teach it. Believe me, I'm, I have in, in various ways, shapes, or form. We just need to be clear. We just need to be clear about what the gospel is. Otherwise, like I said, at best, we are giving people something that's significantly watered down. At worst, we're giving them a false gospel where if they believe what we are preaching and they confess to be a convert to the thing that we're preaching, the false thing that we're preaching— it is sadly and highly possible that that person is not even born again because they didn't even hear the actual gospel. That is my concern. But again, I'm not just saying, well, anybody who's preaching that stuff, it's wrong, it's false, and those people are doomed. No, God is sovereign and he's merciful. Isn't that true? Isn't that true? But we need to be very careful and we need to be very clear. Okay, hallelujah. Number one, the blood of Jesus. The things I saw written down, ancient boundary landmarks, ancient boundary lines that we cannot move. The blood of Jesus. Number two, the gospel of sinful man being reconciled to a holy God. <laughs> and I love number three. That's where I stop. The Lord might download more, but number three is this. And number three is what motivated the book here. It was the baptism. Ooh, I feel it even now of the Holy Ghost and fire. That was number three, ancient boundary line. The baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire. Didn't even say Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost. Why? I've shared a little comment about this on Facebook, but I'll say it again. There's something about when we talk about the Holy Ghost. Mm, come on. There's something that brings back to my memory, and I wasn't even alive during the great part of the 1900s where we saw 
Azusa Street and the impact of Azusa Street, 1906 to 1909, but that really break open the nation of, of America, but also the nations of the earth for that wonderful global Pentecostal movement. Pentecostalism, by the way, was not dead. Or uh, the Pentecostal expression of Christianity didn't just somehow get reborn in 1906 for the Azusa Street revival, by the way. I actually believe that the move and the manifestation of Holy Spirit has been with us ever since Acts chapter 2, ever since the early church. Um, obviously, there were people and eras and history that did not engage it, that did, did not partner with or accommodate the fullness of the Holy Spirit. But I can promise you there have been communities, pockets of people, saints throughout the ages who pressed in to see the fullness of the power of Pentecost, signs, wonders, miracles, deliverance, baptism of the Holy Spirit. They might have had different language, but I'm very grateful the Holy Spirit was never withdrawn or removed from the planet. He wasn't. It wasn't like, you know, he got sucked up in a vacuum following the first, you know, 300 years of church history or when the last apostle died or when the scriptures were canonized. And then, oh, you know what? We're going to just suck the Holy Ghost up into the heavens in some sort of like, you know, vacuum. And then we're going to release him at another time. No, it wasn't, it wasn't that way. He's been with us all along. Holy Spirit has been here for 2000 years of church history. My question is, what are we doing with him? My question is, are we watering even down that wonderful, glorious experience of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire. I love that today. You said, just open this and the fire of God jumped all over more, Lord. I'm just going to end with this because I actually feel like the Lord wants to pour out his spirit right now. Listen, I don't do videos at like 4.30 in the afternoon central time. I typically schedule them. I have a little graphic. I do all that, but the Lord interrupted me. Whoa. I mean, right now, you got to let me know, folks who are watching, and now I'm going to do my best to, as I'm finishing this up, look at the comments. But listen, if you're watching this later on, don't don't pay much attention to what I'm saying right now. I, I believe the glory of the Lord, that baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire. God wants to release that on you. For those of you who are watching right now, do you sense that? I, I even sense that weightiness. You might feel a sensation. You might sense that weightiness of the Holy Spirit on you. You might feel heat. You might feel like a river. You might feel electricity. You might feel the fire of God. I want to incur ask you right now in the comments, do you feel that? I'm, I'm sensing that, that I don't even, what I'm sensing right now, what I'm feeling is an urgency. I, I sense it an excitement maybe, even an excitement from the Lord saying, when I use that very phrase that I saw, yeah, come on, Lord, more, more. I can't make this stuff up. Jeffrey, more on you in the name of Jesus. I, In fact, I just license anybody right now. If you need to just shut down the video and go like, be, be with the Holy Spirit. Whoa, let it be in the name of Jesus. I pray for a fresh baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire. That's exactly the phrase he gave me. And you know what? The baptism of the Holy Spirit, it looks like something. I see people right now trying to reduce it of its power. They're trying to neuter the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Why? Well, we want to make it acceptable. We want to make it just a comfortable prayer. You know, we don't need to do the old school Pentecostal stuff. We don't need that Holy Spirit stuff. Literally, these are things I have heard people say. We don't need all that stuff. We can just, you know, at the end of a service say, hey, anybody want to get filled with the Holy Spirit? Okay, if you want to, that's okay. We're not going to make anybody uncomfortable. I feel it now. Just just lift your hands. I mean, they're, believe me, they're not speaking in tongues. They're trying to make it so neutral and acceptable in our 21st century society. Okay, if you want the baptism of the Holy Spirit, or you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, just lift your hand. You can just stay in your seat. And that's fine. Okay, well, we just prayed for you. You can go. And now we're going to bring our next service in. I'm going to declare right now. I had a dream, and I'll never forget the dream several months ago. I put it in my book where I felt like the Lord said, well, I don't I felt like the Lord was highlighting this phrase, no more wimpy baptisms of the Holy Ghost. What does that mean? It means when somebody experiences the baptism or the immersion, or let me put it this way, the spirit of God that lives inside of you, which is wonderful and he confirms you're safe, him resting upon you or coming upon you. Listen, brother, listen, sister, if God comes on you, something's going to happen. 
Something's going to happen. Father, for Tracy right now, more, Lord. Anybody who's experiencing that, I just encourage you, just partner with the Lord. Just yield, surrender to the Holy Spirit. I can't make that stuff up. I refuse to make it up. I refuse to manufacture anything. I refuse to bop people on the head and call that being slain in the Spirit. But equally, please hear me, equally, I refuse that when the Spirit is moving and when He wants to touch people, I refuse to sanitize it. I refuse to back up, back down, shut up in the same manner it's inappropriate for you to bop somebody on the head and say, hey, so-and-so got filled with the Holy Ghost. It is equally as in the flesh that when the Spirit is moving, you resist Him. You quench Him. Release your fire. Oh, release fire right now. Release fire on the forehead. Release fire on the lips, God. Release fire on the mouth for boldness, God. I thank you, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Every one of our friends who are watching right now would experience a fresh baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire. And if you're watching later on, you just turn this on. I pray even now that the Spirit of God would rest upon you. Oh, Father, thank you for what you're doing. I've got to recognize my friend Gina. I love what you're saying. We must have him working in and through us, blazing a trail of miracle signs, wonders everywhere we go so the world will see him and desire to know him. I'm going to put that up there. I'm going to get technologically savvy, Gina. Pop that up there. Oh, come on. I'm just going to, I'm just going to stay in this. If you have a prayer language, pray in the, just pray in your prayer language. I love Karen, release Holy Ghost fire. Come on. We, we're going to do it. I love doing that. I'm going to put up your little things, put up your little comments, release it, Jesus. Just take another minute. But I always tell people I'm willing to be awkward. I'm willing to be awkward and just kind of wait a minute for the Holy Spirit to do what he wants. He might be done and be like, all right, Larry, you can shut it down. But right now, I believe the Lord's moving on this broadcast. Father, we thank you as we finish up. But God, we want to be sensitive to what you're doing. I thank you, Lord, for the blood of Jesus. Can we just praise him right now? Can we just praise him for those three ancient boundary stones? Those are three that he highlighted. I know there's more. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. And Lord Mary, I see you watching, Mary. I thank you, Lord, for the revival that is going up the I-95, the eastern seaboard being broken open for a move of God. We've heard prophecies for years, but Lord, we're standing on that. God, up from Miami to Maine, the eastern seaboard being broken open up the I-95, Interstate 95 corridor for a history-making, landscape-changing move of the Holy Spirit. Lord, yes, we pray for that fresh anointing. And Mary, you take that up. Keep it burnt. Keep fire on the altar burning in Maine. Is there anybody here in the New England area? Oh, man. I'm like, Lord, are, are, are we done? Anybody in the New England area? I want to pray for you. We're going to be in New England August 11th through 14th in Springfield, Massachusetts. Me, Tommy, and Miriam Evans, you are welcome to come. More information on the way. But we believe God is doing a great work in New England. I declare right now, New Hampshire shall be saved. I declare Vermont shall shift and turn in the name of Jesus. I declare every well of revival in Massachusetts and Connecticut would be open. Father, we declare those wells be open. Spring up a well in the name of Jesus. Come on, we've got Connecticut here. I thank you. I just This is what I feel like the Holy Ghost is putting in my heart. New England and Australia, God, let them have it there too in Jesus' name. Father, I prophesy right now over the revival wells of the 1990s that have that were there in Australia that are like in the ground. This is a vision that the Lord has given me. We're hoping to come to Australia next year. But revival wells in the ground in Australia that were particularly um, built or dug in the 1990s. I believe the Lord is raising those up. I believe it's time for those wells to be reopened in the name of Jesus. Father, thank you for what you're doing. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for that fresh anointing. Oh, Holy Spirit, we thank you for what you're doing. We got South Carolina. We got New York. Hungry for more. Thank you, Lord, for the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Father, that we've been reconciled to God through the blood of Jesus. Sinful us. We were sinful. We were dead in our sins. Thank you, Lord, that we were reconciled to God, to a holy God. That's the gospel. That is the gospel that forever we will praise him for. Forever he will be recognized as the Lamb of God. Why? Because it was his blood that reconciled us to God and actually brought us into his very presence and brought his very presence into us. Joel, come on, Sacramento. Father, I thank you for California, the wells of revival. 
I believe between places like California will be saved and what Cheon's been doing. I believe there is a groundswell in California. We've been seeing it actually the last two years. I believe there's a pushback people in California in the name of Jesus. And finally, we thank you. Those three ancient boundary lines. We thank you for the baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire. We will not be ashamed of the baptism of the Spirit. We will not be ashamed of the manifestations of the Spirit. I always love to say this, and this is a good way to close. I don't tolerate the unusual manifestations of the Spirit. I celebrate them. I celebrate them. Father, I thank you. Come on, that's great. The, pan, the name of the church is Ecclesia, where Joel is. Father, thank you. I love this. We don't really get to connect like this often. But let, we'll finish just praying. Praying, thank you for what you're doing, Lord. Thank you that you're pouring out your spirit on all flesh. Thank you that, Lord, you are giving us dreams and visions. Thank you, Lord, for the baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire. Lord, that we would not be ashamed and we would not back down from that. In the name of Jesus, thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Few very important things. Again, I'm not sure. Please let me know. You'll you'll encourage me. Um, if you have read my new book yet, Pentecostal Fire, I am so thrilled about this because this really represents 22 years of putting language to what I believe the Holy Spirit is releasing in the earth. And I do believe, like he told me last year, he said, I'm reintroducing my church to Pentecostal fire. The book's available now. You can get it on Amazon. A few things coming up. We are going to be doing a gathering, a revival, Awaken New England. Awaken New England. We will be doing that in Springfield, Massachusetts. More information coming. But it'll be August 11th through the 14th. We're going to be doing a series of meetings at the Clarion Hotel in uh, Springfield, Massachusetts with Ignite New England, a wonderful ministry. They're very apostolic in the sense that they've done a great job bringing together a lot of different churches and ministries in the New England area. And then on that Saturday, we're going to be doing a gathering at the DL Moody Center, at the Moody Center, which I believe is going to be outstanding. So Anyway, blessings to you all. Thank you for joining me. More information to come soon. Please share this as you're led. All right.